Rich, welcome to Repart Retirepreneur TV. Thank you, Donna. Okay, so thanks for joining us. And I know we're at end of year, so it's just, uh, it's busy and it's gonna get a whole lot busier. So I was glad you could do this. But I'm interested, um, maybe we could start with your own career journey, because here you are, uh, you know, an entrepreneur, 14 years and counting. And I'm curious uh, what your background was before this and what prompted you to make the leap. Well, my background has always been public accounting, uh, Donna, and, and the gray hair on my head is there for a reason. I've been in the business for 34 years, and I actually started out in the New Jersey, New York area with a, a firm, uh, a couple of different firms there, but mainly a large international firm, and then moved back to Cleveland in 80, 87 and continued my public accounting career. I decided after a five-year stint with um, SS&G, which is now uh, referred to by the name of BDO, uh, they acquired SS&G going on three years ago, that in 2013-14 that I was driving a lot of times out of Hudson only to return to Hudson late at night. Probably like a lot of you know business uh, people that work for large companies and so forth. And uh, I kept missing out on the times and events that was going on in my hometown. And at that point with the you know kids in, in the house and starting to get involved in sports, I said, I want to be a Hudson person. I want to not just be a Hudson person at night or on the weekends. And you know, God bless those uh, people that do drive out or first thing in the morning and come back late at night. And I'm sure the thoughts have entered in their minds that what would it take to start a business in Hudson. So it started about 13 to 14 years ago, and it was not an easy decision, but I'll get into that in a moment when, when you... When I ask you. Yes. But I want to ask one more. So those early years, because I remember even for myself, and I'm not in the same span of what you're doing, but it gets hard just trying to build a client base. So how long before you kind of had steady and predictable income? Well, I'm still waiting for that event, but uh, <laughs> you know, every year the uh, business has grown uh, and, and we more recently merged in with a firm called Donovan Klemenzak and Company. So we're known as DKC Warfield and Company as of January 1st, 2017. And uh, the, uh, the way that works and nobody has a roadmap, uh, a uh, very successful business in town. Uh, Jan Kusick started with herself and another individual, and she grew it to 50 people. And, and she's uh, a heck of a business person, if I'm allowed to say that on TV, but she has done a great job in growing her business. And similar to that, I'm up to nine employees, not up to 50, and myself. But there's no really set, uh, set of rules that you follow or, or are given. Uh, it's like raising children. It's, it's just uh, you figure it out on your own. But usually when you find out that you're there uh, close to 12 to 14 hours a day that maybe it's time to hire another person or maybe you need to be more efficient. So each time my bucket started to flow over, I figured it was time to uh, bring on another person. And you gotta look for the right skill set. And I know one of the things that you're gonna ask me is why not employee versus an independent contractor? Right, because well, I, I went 1099, I figured that's what I'm proposing, but I realized there's limitations. I mean, I can't dictate, I think as it goes, I can't dictate um, the time when work is performed or where it's performed, correct? Correct, those are some of the guidelines that define a subcontractor with an internal revenue code. Uh, an employer-employee relationship is a little different that you can, uh, we, we never 100% dictate our employees what to do because they usually walk out the door if we do that, but sure. the point being is you have a little bit more control if that's the word you're looking for uh, with an employee. And uh, I prefer to have all the people that work for me treat as an employee, um, that way there's no issues. A, with the IRS, and, 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 and B, you know, they usually want the taxes withheld out of their pay as opposed to them having to cover both sides, both the employee side and the employer side on a 1099. And uh, I just feel better when it's a W-2 treatment. Now, some of my employees do have other jobs, and they are part-time, so they're still on a W-2 for me. Um, and some of them are mothers that had children at home and uh, during tax season, they're bored out of their mind, so they want to work tax season only, and I do have some of those employees. Oh, well, that's great. So seasonal really works for that, mm -hmm. that uh, quality of life. Well, I know, and so I did, we, we kind of volleyed some emails back and forth um, on what we might talk about, but then some other news happened, and uh, I want to dig into the, the whole uh, tax changes in the bill that just passed and, and what we might need to be mindful of, maybe at a high level, we can't cover it sure. all. Well, we're gonna do the Chris Berman, uh, you know, Chris Berman three highlights. minute, three minute uh, highlight uh, gonna, version. He could go all the way. <laughs> <laughs> all the way, back, 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 back. But anyway, uh, and that's a, that's a great lead in, Donna. And then, you know, this, this whole thing has been being kicked around by both the Senate and the, the House. And we had a few procedural issues that happened the other night on the way that things were not 
pro you know, properly followed. So I believe the president has since signed the bill, and now all the uh, uh, Thomson Reuters, uh, CCH, um, Paychecks, uh, whoever else are trying to, first one's trying to get to the, to the front of the line to say, hey, you know, here's my summary of the Tax Reform Act. And long and short of it, uh, there's some provisions that apply both personally and also corporately. But, uh, you know, I will tell you this, uh, the House version wanted to limit debt on home mortgages to 500. The Senate said a million. They, you know, like a marriage, they met in the middle. It's 750. Anything over 750 is not deductible. They did go with the Senate version saying that, hey, you can do it on two houses, one and two. But home equity loans are out the door. No more interest on home equity loans. Out Ooh, the door. Okay. Uh, taxes, we call it the SALT. That's the state and local uh, tax deduction. The House wanted zero. The Senate said no. They had something else up their sleeves. Uh, they agreed on that. Uh, I'm not just hitting the highlights, Donna, but uh, basically it's $10,000 is the limit. You can deduct on Schedule A for both your state and local income taxes with all you pay and also your real estate taxes. Got now, it. we all know people that live in Chad Fords or Canary Lakes or Deer Howell, they can meet that $10,000 threshold just with their real estate taxes, so they're out the door. Medical expenses have been pulled back to 7.5% of your AGI. That's effective in, uh, that's one of the provisions that got rolled back into 17 uh, to make it 7.5. Uh, child credits have uh, been bumped up to $2,000 now. For a lot of people in Hudson that make between 150 and up, uh, they never got the benefit of a child credit. Well, those the, the benefit has now been raised. The ceiling's now been raised, the phase that we call it. The, probably the more important two provisions I'll talk on real quickly is the pass-through income. Now with C-Corp uh, tax rates coming down to 21%, C-Corp is unlike an S-Corp or partnership or a, a Schedule C. It's, you know, the big, the big boys like the uh, Altels and the, uh, you know, uh, Hormel Foods and the uh, AT&T where they pay the big tax rate. Of course, they probably have research and development to bring it down to zero anyway. But they're all going to be maximum rates going to be 21. Well, what they decide is that they, how does that affect our small business owners, you know, like yourself, Donna, myself, and others. Um, well, for people other than professional service um, uh, companies, people that render accounting, architectural, legal, and so forth, manufacturers, uh, retail, so forth, they have a special provision to back off 20% of that income off the K-1 to subject at a lower tax rate. I'm not going to get into all the twists and turns of that provision because there's a lot of them. There's a lot of things that prevent someone from taking a reduced salary in an increased K-1 by being able to take more of that 20%. So that's all I got to say on that. Last but not least, alternative minimum tax, as we call it the DDT tax, deduction denial tax. Um, that used to be when you could you know, not get the benefit of your state and local taxes withheld out of your pay, your real estate taxes, and certain excess miscellaneous deductions. That tax is still in force. The House wanted to repeal it. The Senate said no. They met, and it's now still in force. But what they did is they increased the exemption. So the bottom line is that hopefully less people will be getting caught in that AMT tax. A couple business provisions that are going to change. Section 179 has been extended through the year of 2000. Um, for 2024, excuse me, um, and then and net operating loss carrybacks are gone. You can only carry a net operating loss forward. Last but not least, uh, if Donna was thinking about taking me golfing out at her local country club, entertainment is no longer deductible, but meals are still at 50 percent. So that remains untouched, but it was the that entertainment factor. You know, that, I have you know, to think that these rules. Well, first of all, a couple of things you brought up that are particularly, um, I think, of interest to this audience. So a lot of uh, people that are looking to make the leap from job to freelance gig are, are going to go down that consulting route. So much of what you've discussed does, is not impacting them. Does not it does not change things. Uh, Professional Service Corp, as defined in the Internal Revenue Code, architects, accountants, lawyers consultants and so forth, people that are rendering, the main people behind rendering those type of services, this provision does not um, help them um, under the new tax reform act. Very interesting, and we're gonna have to watch how this all unfolds, but even that little small thing, because this is an opportunity, if you, know, if you do go to that freelance gig, there's some opportunity to take clients out for lunch or dinner and, and write off 50%. Um, but now, the, not the golf game. How does that even play out? I won't even, that's a whole other show when we well, figure out the well, industry impact. One other thing I, I failed to say, Don, and it was right in the beginning, was the tax rate. The highest tax rate was dropped from 39.6 to 37. So that, that is a little bit of a benefit for those people in the higher tax. And they've been dropped progressively all the way down sure. you know, the ladder. All right. Well, that's a lot to digest. And again, it just happened like 24 hours ago, I think, the bill passed, if that long ago. 
So look at you, you're just like ready to hit the ground running. Um, so with these kinds of changes and staying up to speed on this, let's talk a little bit about the services you provide, because I have to think that some people make the mistake of kind of going DIY and it's hard for them to stay up to speed on, mm -hmm. on legislation changes and tax changes. So talk to me about the, the services that your company provides for, and I'm talking more the either the solopreneur or a very small business, you know, two to five people. Well, you know, being a local CPA firm here located in Hudson and, and located now for, for several years, uh, and there's some other good ones here in Hudson too, um, we, we, we get the opportunity to work with a lot of small business clients. And, and you know, we become, uh, because they can't afford a controller or, or maybe they're just at that threshold where they can't afford one, we become an extension of, of their controller. A lot of them use QuickBooks. A lot of them really don't know what you're talking about when you send back Justin Journal entries at the end of the year or, or what you're talking about on accrual versus cash or what you're talking about when you're talking tax savings ideas. You know, they like to believe they do and they nod their head they do, but the bottom line is that our type of clientele is not necessarily somebody making ten thousand dollars a year, uh, you know, and putting together receipts in a shoebox, but is somebody that you know might be on a Schedule C, uh, someone that has a great idea that wants to take it to the next level, um, all the way up to our largest clients, thirty-five million dollars in sales, and they're they're a food processing company out of or distribution company out of Maple Heights. Uh, so we have a, a wide range of of clientele, along with doing some high net worth individuals. Uh, 1040s, estates, trusts, and so forth, not-for-profits. Uh, so we, we're, we're constantly busy, even though a lot of people think I play a lot of golf during the summer. They, and that's, that's, that's pretty much true if you ask some people, but uh, it, it, public accounting is a, is a, is a year-round, you know, keep your, keep your thumb on the, uh, you know, on the pulse, uh, if that's the proper saying I'm looking for. Uh, so you've got a wide, well, you have a wide range of, of clients, and they span size, you know, large to small, but are you seeing more people age 50 and older kind of saying, you know what, I'm starting my own business? I mean, is that happening um, from your perspective? It, it, it varies. I mean, obviously you like to see it at a younger age, but I think in the last uh, four or five months I've had about a handful of people that are in that age bracket. One of them is one of my good friends I've known for years. He just got tired of working for someone and he's starting up a painting business. Uh, you know, it's very territorial because it's a franchise or franchisee type relationship, but at 57 years old, he's starting it up. I'm like, okay, fine, whatever makes you float. You're gonna get up on a ladder and, and you know, no, he's gotta find the jobs and then he, he'll find the crews to paint the houses. But, you know, some people just reach the, the end of the rope with working for a big company. I mean, to be honest with you, if, you're, if you don't have the stomach for, you know, you know where's the next um, business gonna come from and, and how are you gonna meet payroll this week for your staff and, and things of that nature, and you're always the last one to get paid. Don't get me wrong, when times are good, you can take out a little bit more extra, and employees are always saying, hey, where's my share? But when times are not so good, you're always the last one to get paid, so you better be ready to accept those kind of conditions. Sure, but, um, but there's, it's interesting, because Kauffman Foundation kind of tracks uh, startups nationwide, and actually the fastest growing segment is 50 and older. And I think there's a certain level of experience and, and, and insight that helps guide, you know, a company. So uh, I guess it depends. Well, Don, that's a very good point. I did, you know, see the introduction of your uh, presentation today on, on this, the, you know, the stats that you provided. And I think in our business, and then also in the in the financial advisory business, I think the, a couple or an individual would like to see somebody with a few gray hairs on their head, as opposed to young whippersnapper at 24 that hasn't really seen or done the ropes yet. You know? Right. So it just it depends. Well, that's a good segue to estate planning, a few, few gray hairs here. So um, this crowd is definitely, there's a good many people that they're looking to beef up their retirement savings nest egg. Um, so there's the, there's the tax piece of that, of earning kind of an, uh, an additional revenue stream. Pensions are kind of going away. Mm -hmm. But then you're going a step further. You're involved there and you're involved in estate planning. Tell me more about that. Uh, estate planning is fun. Uh, I can honestly tell you we don't draft documents. That's where we use a team approach. Uh, we bring an attorney in and we certainly want to bring the financial advisor in too, and along with the client and, and ourselves as the accountant. So where the accountants get involved on is that if there's trust set up for the kids or 
uh, you know, there's trust for whatever purposes, health, welfare, special needs. We're the uh, people that will prepare those tax returns for the people. But along the same lines, if there's estate planning, like, oh, gee, how much should I have in this bucket? How much should I have in this bucket? When I talk about buckets, I mean pre-tax, post-tax, real estate, and so forth on. Because everybody, and, and there's a lot of good financial advisors in town. There's a lot of good financial advisors in Northeast Ohio. Everybody should surround themselves with one because I realize a lot of people want to do this stuff on their own, whether it be Vanguard, Fidelity, Charles Schwab. But, you know, you really should involve yourself with a good financial advisor. And we work as a team together. As a matter of fact, I'm just helping a guy in a couple of different memos for, for him, a guy that came in off the street, saw me in the Pro Picks, which my face is in that newspaper almost every week. And he, and he said, I want you to help me with this estate planning. Well, he's selling his company or his interest in a company to his kid. He's dropping his house into an LLC for his other kids. Uh, and he's doing all sorts of things to move things around so him and his wife can have cash flow. Uh, into retirement. So the bottom line is, you know, that's estate planning isn't drafting the documents. That's for attorneys. But the bottom line is, you can help people solve their 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 issues or help them with their ideas and convert it um, and, and make it actual. But you know, one of the things that I've seen probably the most abusive on down is, and it, estate planning goes as far as changing your designation on your 401k or your IRA beneficiary forms. I've seen trusts set up, but the assets haven't been entitled. They haven't been titled to the trust yet. Well, that's incomplete estate planning. So someone that'll just walk the person all the way from A to Z through the whole process. Well, and I like how you described it. Really does take um, an assortment of lenses. You know, the accounting, the legal, the so bringing that group together is important. Yes, um, ma'am. So let's talk about community involvement and, and, and the impact on business. So I didn't meet you until all of a sudden we're both in the Rotary. You were there for mm -hmm. quite a while, and I came barreling in, I don't know, about six, seven years ago. No one's taught me the secret handshake yet, by the way. How long do I have to be there before I leave? Oh, you have to ask the, either the, bad, <laughs> the bad girl table or the bad boy table. But you know, Rotary Club of Hudson is one of a number of, of, of areas where you're involved. I was looking on your website. You were. You're treasurer and board member for Tech Hudson, I mean the Ohio Ballet, Hudson Chamber of Commerce, Lake Forest Country Club, Hudson Community Foundation. You really have had involvement in a number of ways. What impact, to what degree has the volunteer activity you've done in the community had an impact on your business? Well, you know, you, you meet good people, whether you're on the Hudson Community Foundation board or in meeting people like yourself through Rotary. You know, we all have things to do in the morning, and sometimes it's tough to get up at, at you know, 5.45 to go to Rotary. And I hear some people say, I don't want to go to Rotary at 7.15. I, I can't get up that early. The bottom line is, you know, and accountants are probably the worst because us and actuarials tend to be historians by nature. But if you don't make an effort to get out and meet people, then your network is going to be so tight and limited. And then you're going to be wondering, why did you ever, never grow your business? So my main reason for doing it was to grow my business when I was younger. And my first marketing person I had years ago, 20 plus years ago, said, you need to get involved in the chamber where you live and where you work. So I got involved in both the Mayfield Heights Chamber and the Hudson, and later became the president of the Hudson Chamber of Commerce, uh, and later became the president of Rotary, and the treasurer of the Ohio Ballet, and so forth, as the resume says. But these are a lot of involvements that take time away from you. you still got billable hours, you still got employees, mm -hmm. and a lot of these events either happen first thing in the morning or at night, and a lot of people just want to go home, because yep. they're either A, they're just not built out for this, and if you're going to leave your big time, uh, you know, employer W-2, you better understand it. It's just not sitting in your desk at home expecting the next client to walk through the door. You have to get out there and make an effort to get to know people, give back to your community. Now, some of these events or some of these organizations are, are not Hudson related, like LifeWorks Leadership over in Independence, Ohio Society Advanced Tax Conference. The Ohio Society Advanced Tax Conference was putting together a great two-day seminar for a lot of people at the end of the year to get CPE in and we call it now the mega tax conference, or Lake Forest. I was a member of the country club. We've been out there since 1999. And you know, I was treasurer for three years during three of the hardest years right after the last economy crashed mm -hmm. in 07, 08. We're looking at selling off assets to stay alive, not what we can do you know, by increasing membership. We're just looking to stay alive. But those are the things, because people see that you put the extra time in, the extra effort, and there's no guarantees. You might not get anything out of it. Um, but they're all great organizations they all give back to the to, to the communities that they're in and uh, you meet some great people there Donna. I agree I think that there's like a you just by nature are around people that are go-givers 
you know. And in the process, you end up meeting a lot of good people. And, and the business the business things happen, but I don't think that you just expect them. It's not your original intent to go in there, no. even though it might be in the back of your mind that, hey, you know, be sure it'd be nice to pick up a, a new consulting, uh, you know, opportunity for Don or a new tax turn for, for Rich, you know. Well, you know what? We're coming down to the wire here. Um, I know that we had a lot more to cover, so hopefully, um, maybe after tax season, I can get you back again. But um, let me just think about the people listening right now, and, and primarily, there's a lot of different segments tuning in, but one, the primary segment are people working full-time jobs and starting to kind of side hustle, or at least give some serious thought to how they're going to transition to some kind of future freelance gig. With, them, with those people in mind, what tips would you give them? Well, you better have a good business plan, and you, you know it's, it's always hard to leave a pretty steady income number coming in, especially when you have a, a nice house in Hudson and, and you know a, a lovely spouse and a couple kids in the house. Um, so it's not an easy task to leave, but at some point in time, you, either you just got to, you know, as they say, jump in the pool or not, um, jump in the deep end, I guess is the saying. And, 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 you know, it's, it's, there's going to be some rough times in the beginning, but if, I guess follow your heart, follow your passion. I know you're passionate about what you do uh, with media and, and consulting and all that. And, you know, I was passionate about what I do, even though it's fine, kind of hard to find an accountant that's passionate. But you really have to love what you're doing. If you don't love what you're doing, then people aren't going to use you. Absolutely. You know? And I've heard that so in, in recent interviews, and it, it mirrors what I'm seeing, there are exceptions, but it seems like three years is the point when things start to gel. If you're consistently going after it, that's when the revenue starts to really gel. Would that, is that what you're seeing? I, yeah, I would tend to agree. I, my situation was a little different. I merged into SS&G with a book of business, and I unmerged coming out. So I had a little bit of a, uh, but before I went in, you're right, I, I, I had to develop that book of business. And, and it just depends. You know, there's a lot of CPAs that just want to do everything themselves and don't have, want any staff and they don't work good with people and they're upset with employees and they don't like the way they do it and blah, blah, blah. There's got to be some give and take because sure. everybody has their individual style and, um, um, you know, you got to be flexible. All right. So if people are intrigued, they want to they find out more about Warfield and company, what should they do? They should either email me at uh, um, rwarfield um, um, at warfieldcompany.com. Call us at 330-655-1395, um, you know, and uh, we'll be more than happy to meet with you and get to know you. Awesome. Rich, thanks for today. All uh, right. I'll pull back.